Hi, welcome to Washington Policy Center's virtual solution series. Uh, my name is David Bose. I'm the communications director for Washington Policy Center. Uh, on the dock today, we have our small business director, Mark Harmsworth, uh, as well as our Center for Small, uh, 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 our Center for Government Reform director, Jason Mercier. And the format's going to go something like this. Um, I'm going to kick the presentation off to, to uh, Jason Mercier, who will talk with you about local uh, income tax uh, dangers um, and hopefully some collective bargaining transparency issues. And then uh, he'll bring in Mark Harmsworth, our small business director, to talk about uh, some of the local um, taxing districts and local methods of taxation um, and other business challenges. Then we'll get into the Q&A section. Um, where anything goes, and we'll take your questions. All you need to do is use the chat function. Um, should be in the toolbox for your GoToWebinar um, toolbox right there up on the upper right of your screen. So you can use the, the question uh, chat function for that. Or you can email me, at D as in David, Bows, B as in boy, O, Z as in zebra, E as in egg, at WashingtonPolicy.org. Um, I'll be answering those emails, collecting those questions, and then um, I'll, I'll uh, assemble those for the Q&A section at the end. So you can ask a question at any time. Um, I'll be uh, collecting those, like I say. And then what I'm going to do just to make the presentation uh, more appealing, of course, is to take myself off the screen. So uh, you'll hear my voice, but you won't see me again until the end of the program. I'd also like to uh, point out to you on the right-hand side, there is uh, a place where you can you can um, click links to some of uh, Jason Mercier's uh, policy guides, policy documents um, that are related to his presentation today, as well as the Washington Policy Center Policy Guide. That's a once every four year publication that Washington Policy uh, Center puts out that's essential for citizen activists, um, state lawmakers, um, candidates, and, and others, and it gives you a, a, a wide overview of state policy and over 60 recommendations for how to improve state government policy so highly recommended you can uh, you can find that link right there um, on your go to webinar uh, link section as well so with that i'd like to bring to the table um, our center for small uh, our center for government reform director jason mercier uh, jason uh, as always uh, great to hear from you looking forward to the presentation and uh, why don't you kick it off by uh, talking to us a bit about the uh, danger that we now face of local income taxes, city-based income taxes, uh, based on what has happened in the statewide income, uh, income tax battle to date. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dave. And you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about a local income tax? Isn't that against state law? Well, up until last summer, it was, but things have changed radically through the courts and by some inaction by our legislature this past year. But to really give you the story and what it means and some of the things that you can do at the local level to prevent this, I'm going to take you back in time. We're going to get a time machine. We're going to go back to the 1930s. And believe it or not, in the 1930s, the voters actually passed a statewide income tax. But it was immediately challenged for being unconstitutional. And the state Supreme Court did, in fact, strike down that income tax. And the reason they did so is if you look at Washington's constitution, we have the broadest definition of property that you will find in any state constitution across the country. It says property is everything subject to ownership, whether tangible or intangible. So if you own your income, it is property. And that's what the Supreme Court in the 1930s ruled. They said, you own your income, it's property. Now that doesn't mean you can't have an income tax in Washington. It just means it has to conform with the restrictions on property taxes. And that means uniformity and no more than 1% of value. So you can have a flat 1% income tax in the state of Washington. Now, after that ruling, the legislature actually over the next few decades sent the voters six constitutional amendments to overturn that ruling, to say that income is not property, to allow a graduated income tax. And each time the voters overwhelmingly rejected them. So even though they passed that original income tax, since that time, the voters have rejected 10 straight proposals to allow a graduated income tax, including six constitutional amendments. So what does that have to do with a local income tax? Well, not winning at the ballot box, but still wanting to try to push through a graduated income tax, folks started thinking, well, we're not convincing the voters, so maybe we can get five of the nine justices to change their mind, to overturn 
almost 100 years of ruling saying that you own your income. And they were looking for a volunteer. And in 2017, the Seattle City Council willfully volunteered and say, we'll be your guinea pigs. We're going to go ahead and willfully and knowingly pass an illegal Seattle graduated income tax so that we can be sued and go to the Supreme Court and see if we can get them to say that we don't own our income anymore. They got part of what they wanted. They were immediately sued. But Seattle and this effort faced several challenges. Not only do you have the constitutional definition that income is property, but cities had a, a different threshold. There were prohibitions on cities imposing an income tax. The first is the fact that local governments are creatures of the state, which means they don't have taxing authority unless they've been given that permission from the legislature. The legislature has never given cities authority to tax income. The second strike that Seattle faced is that in 1984, the legislature actually passed an explicit prohibition. So not only have they not given permission to tax income, but they outright prohibited it. It was a one page bill and it simply said cities, city, counties, counties may not impose an income tax, period. So when this went to King County Superior Court, they didn't even get to the constitutional question that Seattle was wanting because what courts will do is they'll start on a statutory review before they get to constitutional questions. And the King County Superior Court said, you don't have permission to do this. And oh, by the way, there's an explicit 1984 prohibition. When this went to the Court of Appeals last summer, though, this is where things went sideways. And this is why today we are now talking about every government that has property tax authority in the state of Washington also having income tax authority. What the Court of Appeals did last summer one thing that everybody thought it would do is it said Seattle specific graduated income tax was unconstitutional because it violated the constitutional restrictions on property taxes. But then things got very bizarre. The appeals court said that that 1984 law that the legislature passed explicitly prohibiting local income taxes was unconstitutional. They said that one page bill violated the single subject requirement. So that removed the explicit prohibition you still didn't have the grant of authority. And that next step that the Court of Appeals took may seem logical, but I'm gonna explain why it isn't. The Court of Appeals said, well, we know that income is property because that's what the Supreme Court has said. And we know that local governments have property tax authority. Therefore, every local government can impose a flat 1% income tax. The problem with that analysis and where the logic starts to fall off is that property tax authority that the legislature has given local governments as an exemption. It exempts taxing intangible personal property. And if you look at the statutory definition, intangible personal property is defined to include money. Somehow, Seattle got the Court of Appeals to determine that income is not money. So where we stand now with that Court of Appeals ruling, graduated income tax is still unconstitutional. The 1984 explicit prohibition on local income taxes was overturned and the Court of Appeals determined that if you have property tax authority, you also have income tax authority. So that case was not appealed by the plaintiffs because they won on the fact that they can't have a graduated income tax, but Seattle appealed it. Seattle wanted the state Supreme Court to change that appeals court ruling to say that income's not property so that everybody in the state can have a graduated income tax. And what just happened in the last month, the state Supreme Court refused to hear that case. They rejected it, which means the appeals court decision stands. Now, the good news, there's going to be no graduate income taxes. The bad news, because that appeals court ruling stands, that 84 explicit prohibition is off the books and every government with property tax authority now can do a flat 1% income tax. Now, before that Supreme Court ruling came out, there were efforts in the legislature, bipartisan efforts with Republicans and Democratic sponsors in both the House and the Senate to simply reinstate that 1984 law that when it was passed in 1984, almost passed unanimously to prohibit that local income tax. Those bills were not even given a public hearing. So this gets now to what you can do in your local government and what voters in Spokane wisely did last November. Just because everybody has authority to impose a local income tax doesn't change the fact that it remains highly unpopular. And in fact, before all of this started, we at the Washington Policy Center did a statewide poll that was heavily weighted even with a King County Seattle sample to see, is there an appetite 
have, have voters changed their minds from the last 10 times they've rejected income tax proposals? And what we discovered is no, the sentiment remains the same. 72% of Washingtonians still remain opposed to a local income tax. So what happened last year in Spokane, and Spokane's a little bit of a different situation than most cities. It's a charter city, a first class city. There's only about a handful of those in the state of Washington, but these cities have the ability to amend their charter, basically their city constitution. And the voters can try to propose those changes as well. So last year, Spokane voters, by a vote of 73%, amended Spokane city charter to prohibit Spokane from imposing any type of income tax. And you saw after Spokane did this, a couple of code cities, so Spokane Valley and Granger passed ordinances prohibiting a local income tax. Now they don't have the same weight of a charter because again, the next city council can come in and change an ordinance. But what Spokane Valley and Granger were doing were trying to signal to their citizens and to their business community, if somehow cities are given the authority to impose an income tax, we're not gonna take advantage of that. We're gonna continue to keep the competitive advantage of not taxing income and not trying to, what the Department of Commerce says is a very important advantage for businesses to have. We're not gonna throw that away. This is something that any city council and even at the county level with property tax authority can do as well. Now Seattle, after the Supreme Court ruling said they're gonna to try to take advantage of their new authority. They're gonna to try to impose that flat 1% income tax. The issue with doing this city by city is capital can move, citizens can move. And in fact, you know, some people have joked that this effort in Seattle to impose an income tax is truly a, a secret motivation by the Bellevue City Chamber uh, of Commerce to try to get people to move over to Bellevue. And that's kind of what you can see happening if you do this city by city. So what we are encouraging local governments to do is notwithstanding the fact they now have this authority by virtue of this appeals court decision to instead follow the lead of Spokane Spokane Valley and Grazier and just affirmatively say, we're not gonna go down this road for our businesses, for our citizens. We're gonna maintain our no income tax advantage. And if you see Seattle, other cities start to do this, then you can start to have some competitive advantage marketing of trying to say, hey, come to our city. You're not gonna have to pay this tax. So that's what's happening on the income tax effort. The other issue we wanted to bring to your attention, again, something that Spokane did this past November, is on collective bargaining transparency. If you look at Washington State's public records and open meetings laws, we have some of the strongest mandates for transparency in the country. We don't allow our local officials to make fiscal decisions behind closed doors without our knowledge and without our input. But there is currently one major part of local spending that is not subjected to that transparency standard, and that's those collective bargaining agreements and those drive a lot of the fiscal costs because that's a lot of the compensation and the payroll. Now, if you look at our open meetings laws, it doesn't prohibit transparency, it's just not mandated. So something that you've seen several communities, counties, school districts in the state of Washington do is say, we're gonna go ahead and provide the same level of transparency on these contracts that we do for our other fiscal decisions. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like a, a public hearing where people get to provide comment on it. But the press and the public is able to sit in into those discussions so they can at least see what trade-offs are being provided for those contracts. And what happened last year, again, as a charter city, Spokane's voters also amended their charter with almost an 80% vote to show you the, the popularity of this, saying that in the city of Spokane, those contract agreements would follow an open process to where the public would be able to sit in on those meetings. This is something that's not uh, unique to Washington. There are almost two dozen states across the country that already require the standard, including our neighbors to the south in Oregon. And you'll often hear, you know, we can't do things this way because it will be too disruptive or you won't be able to have frank discussions. But you don't see that bear out in those states that already require this. Again, with it being in Oregon and Idaho, Texas, Florida, states that already have the standard. And we wanted to know, well, what's the difference? Because we're hearing that from some people in Washington, if we did this, they just would never be able to come to agreement. They wouldn't be able to have a good discussion and, and make good decisions. So we talked to some of the members of the Oregon School Board Association to say, well, how does this work for your school districts? 
And the comment that we got back, and I believe this is one of the links that you have on the handouts, is that, you know, at first, everybody was saying the same thing that you hear in Washington. You just can't do this. It'll be too difficult. People will grandstand. But what we discovered after it became part of the normal process, people just got accustomed to it. And they don't see the objections to it that some are expressing here in Washington. At the end of the day, transparency for fiscal decisions is one of the things that we expect and demand as citizens. And it just makes for good fiscal policy, especially as we come out of this COVID-19 situation where you're going to be having to make very difficult budget decisions. Are you going to be asking your voters for additional tax resources? If you're going to be doing that, can you show that you have made the best decisions elsewhere in your budget, the trade-offs you've made elsewhere in your contracts, and this is where this transparency helps to show that you've been making those best decisions. Now, even if you can't get to the full place of having full open meetings on these talks, another model you can follow is something that you see several cities in California do. They call it COIN, Civic Openness and Negotiations. And now, while these aren't open meetings, every document that exchanges hands between the public sector unions and the city officials gets posted online with fiscal scoring. And this helps kind of get away of what some times happens frequently with these school district negotiations where the school district says, hey, we have a great offer. So the teacher union says, oh, they don't respect us. They're not providing a fair package. But nobody really knows what either side is actually proposing. And what this COIN model provides, the civic openness and negotiation is, with the offers and counter offers publicly posted, it quickly becomes clear if anybody is acting in bad faith playing games. So if you can't do the full open meetings, the next step would be to do that coin process. But we know both with the collective bargaining transparency and with the local income tax bans, thanks to what happened in November with Spokane, these are not only good policy, but incredibly popular across partisan lines, both Republicans and Democrats supporting these with an excess of 70%. Now, Spokane is obviously not the Tri-Cities, but it's as close as Seattle on the east side of the city as you're gonna come. So it's not what you're gonna be able to easily label as a conservative state. It's a good cross transaction of Washington politics. And again, we saw those bear out in statewide polls as well. So something to be concerned about on the local income tax, an opportunity to close that door, opportunity for transparency on the con uh, collective bargaining, talks. I'll be happy to take your questions here a little bit later, but at this time I would like to bring in our small business director, Mark Tomworth, to talk about what you can be doing right now as we address our budgets with your tax policy. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Jason, for your presentation there. I'm going to do a little screen share if I can, and you should now be seeing a uh, slide deck. Uh, thanks for coming today, everybody. Uh, appreciate your uh, time uh, to come and listen to us drone on about what could be a very dry subject, but uh, for some of us, uh, it's um, it's definitely uh, definitely something that we're passionate about. Um, just to just to remind you, um, you can uh, put a question in the little box on the chat function, so you can get. Um, uh, your questions answered later, both for Jason and for I, and David will be moderating that once we're through these two little presentations. So today I'm talking about uh, municipal taxes. Um, as you may know, um, my history, uh, I spent seven years on the Mill Creek City Council, one of those years as the Mayor Pro Tem, and then four years in the state legislature. And so I've seen taxation from both sides of the story, um, and I have some very strong opinions about it. Um, and so. What we're going to be talking about today is the types of property tax that um, we can uh, that you can use at the municipal level and when it's appropriate to do it. I've got a funny feeling I have a 10 second advance on this deck. So if it moves forwards, I apologize. I will flip back if it does. So here are the different types of uh, taxes that typically, excuse me, typically are used by the uh, a local municipality. Uh, you have the big one, which is really property tax for a lot of small cities sales taxes, uh, utility taxes, B&O taxes, EMS levies, impact fees, REIT taxes, so the portion that the city has for that, car taps, uh, which are obviously voted in some cases, and other taxes, which you see, hotel, lodging, water, library levy, license fees, franchise agreements, 
wireless and cable. So there's a bevy of different things a municipality uses to pay its bills at the end of the day. Um, each of these taxes has pluses and minuses. Um, the, the property tax, which is typically used um, in the majority of our small cities, as I already mentioned, uh, is the one that is the most stable in, in these situations. The um, sales tax, while um, useful, we're now seeing as we're going through COVID that that is not as, not as uh, stable as it could be. So I'm gonna advance here. Hopefully this slide doesn't have a 10 second delay on it. Uh, property tax, I've just mentioned, most stable revenue. Um, most municipalities use this um, pretty much to the maximum capability they can. Um, that's uh, every year they'll, they'll increase up to the, the state maximum, which is 1%. Um, and if you don't use it, there's bank, there's bank capacity on that as well. Um, so uh, that vote typically is taken in November and uh, the city councils will go through and vote that through as a uh, councilmatic tax increase. I know in Mill Creek, the city that I served in, we went um, multiple years without having to increase property tax because we had a good reserve. And we were focused on um, uh, spreading our tax base across the different tax types to minimize the impact to uh, our property owners. Now, one of the things that we focused on is sales tax to try and increase that as a proportion while still keeping property tax as a stable base to pay the bill so that we had some risk um, uh, across the different types of taxes. We also have an EMS levy in the city of Mill Creek, which uh, pays for ER, EMS services, emergency medical services. And we typically would um, increase that each year because we felt that that was an essential service that the city needed to provide. Um, and then REIT taxes. Now, as, as a city, Mill Creek is relatively young, uh, 25, 30 years old. And so it um, relied heavily in its early years uh, as it was building out on those REIT dollars and, the, and that went into our reserve. And then we started to um, spend some of that money on maintenance and operations. Now, um, the uh, REIT taxes you have to be careful with if you're an elected official. It, it looks like you've got all this extra money coming in, but in fact, that money is a one-time shot in the arm because of the way the property tax is actually collected, as you may know, with the levy rate based on assessed value in your city, not a percentage necessarily. So it's not like if the property values go up, you start seeing more money, which is often a confusing point for a new elected official who uh, will set a property tax rate and then think this money's gonna go up as the assessed value goes up. No, the, the additional revenue you receive as a city only goes up when uh, your uh, assessed value goes up by new development, which is where these REIT taxes come from. And if you're a realtor, you'll know there's several versions of REIT um, and uh, there's, they're very protective over those REIT dollars because they're dedicated to spending, um, specifically if you're doing new development, those dollars are used to build out infrastructure around um, the, the development that's going in there. Uh, additionally, impact fees are big for a local municipality. Um, when we're using impact fees, um, we need to be very careful that we use them judiciously to build out the infrastructure to support the development that um, has, has been built as a result of the, the, the tax dollars being collected. And so often a municipality will put in a pocket park or a street light or something like that using the impact fees. And my encouragement to our electeds that are on the line is that they consider a regional approach uh, as well as that local approach because the, um, uh, the, the impacts, those cars that leave the new neighborhood, if you build uh, 2,000 new apartments in your city, those 2,000, 3,000 trips per day that are going in and out of that apartment, um, they're not just disappearing when they get onto the next side street, they go someplace. And um, that's where uh, partnering with the state to make sure that our regional infrastructure supports the additional trips uh, is really important. And then with the other taxes and fees, um, dedicating those to the purpose and don't be tempted to rate the accounts. If, if you're collecting a, a specific tax for a reason as your municipality, keep it dedicated to that. That's what the taxpayers expect. And um, you should be doing that. And that's the principle that I applied. So I'm gonna to go to this slide here. Elected officials manage what they have or ask for more. So this is a principle that I applied as an elected official, um, which I'd encourage folks to think about, is when you're elected, you're elected to manage the resources that the voters have given you. And that may include adjustments to fees and a few other taxes. But overall, um, 
excuse me, overall, um, what I believe that meant was if I couldn't get the, ba the budget to balance and I couldn't pay for the essential services as a municipality, then I needed to go back to the voters and ask them and present to them a, uh, an option to pay for that service. So um, often, as an example, um, you'll, uh, you'll be elected and you'll inherit a deficit budget and uh, you'll go through that budget and you've done everything you possibly can to streamline costs and you realize that um, despite all of that, you still need to do, for example, a, an overlay on, uh, on your streets, so just a regular road maintenance. And so um, uh, you're gonna have to go back to the people and say, okay, uh, we're gonna need to pay for uh, an overlay on the streets. Now, if you just vote that through as a tax increase, arguably, um, you know, your population is gonna get pretty mad at you. So, uh, that's where you would go back to the vote of people. If you're putting in a new facility, if you decided to put in um, a, a community center or a senior center or something like that, um, that's where I believe you should be going back to the people and saying, hey, uh, we, you know, we'd like you to choose um, if uh, you can have, uh, if you want this facility and you're willing to tax yourself. Um, we've also seen, obviously, you're competing with uh, local levies for school districts and for other um, municipal organizations, which we're going to touch on here in a second. Um, but uh, you're having to compete with these people for these tax dollars. So it's important that everyone gets to weigh in on how their tax dollars are spent and what they're spent on. The, um, the sales tax component of this does have a cap on it. So we've seen with Sound Transit, as an example, um, pushing towards the top of that cap and in Linwood and Mill Creek, which have the two highest sales taxes um, as of a few months ago anyway, um, in the state, uh, which clears about 10.4% is the last reckoning I saw. Um, so you, you end up hitting a cap. And so you don't want to be um, going out there without, without that, obviously. Um, when you're passing taxes, do specific purposes. Um, think about renewals and expirations on that tax. Um, if you're building a facility, put an expiration on it. It's the right thing to do. It, it's they're not in perpetuality. I can say that. It's easy for me. And um, you can uh, put that expiration on there so that people are confident that that tax will go away once the facility that they've approved has been built or the maintenance operations piece that you needed to do has been built as well. Um, and I touched briefly on the bank capacity here. Um, that really is what we would consider as a city, what I consider as a city, the so the last stop gap. If if everything went wrong in a COVID situation, then you know maybe that's something we would look at. Although I would argue right now, I think the uh, the cities and the state should be um, making cuts, like the rest of us are having to make cuts to get through this crisis. So those are sort of the mechanisms you can have. So the principles that um, uh, you know I'd encourage the electeds to apply here is. Um, think about uh, what you have and using that appropriately. You've been elected to manage that and then only go back to the to the tax pool when you need the additional money because of uh, a change in the environment and then ask the voters permission for it. And that's the way that I, 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 um, I served as a council member and I try to think in those terms. Um, I want to touch on transportation benefit districts as we close here. Uh, transportation benefit districts are a tool that uh, the state gave cities to enable them to pay for expensive transportation projects. And what I'm talking about here is not the, I want to exclude specifically, not um, roads of regional significance. So if you've got a state highway, an SR coming through your city, um, that's where um, uh, I think the state needs to step up. Obviously, it's a state highway, so they're going to do that anyway. But you may end up with a street, um, and I'm thinking of one street here in my local area, which carries around 20,000 cars per day. It's a regional significant street and arguably could almost be a state route. So I'm not talking about those types of roads. What I'm talking about is the roads that sort of go through your city and um, provide um, uh, the the access to your your facilities in your city and the homes and just moving around inside your city there and sometimes you need additional money to either expand that adjust it or do whatever it is you need to do the tool that the state has given a city is a transportation benefit district and a benefit district is created as an alternate to the straight transportation budget request which is typically where cities are uh, looking uh, all the time for money um, and this is why I want to differentiate between the streets that are uh, of significance and the local streets. Um, 
what happens is a lot of the time it will put in a um a request into the state budget for a project because we can't afford it as a city because either we didn't budget correctly or uh, we haven't thought far enough ahead to, to put that money aside as part of our re or mitigation dollars when we collected them when these uh, streets were built and we'll go and ask the city will go and ask uh, the state for some money to go build a specific transportation issue fix an issue inside the city limits the problem with that is of course the rest of the state ends up paying for it and if it's not a regional significantly uh, large project, um, then uh, what you're basically doing is loading up the state transportation budget with money that should be collected at a local level to pay for that local impact project. So uh, you, you can imagine in a, and I'm talking really neighborhood streets here and, and the, those types of things. Um, so uh, benefit districts were created to try and stop that problem from happening a few years back. Uh, they're focused on local projects, they're scoped, time limited, and they're locally voted, which back to my original point of if, if you need to build a new road somewhere in town, you can put that back to the voters and say, this is something that you did not ask me to manage necessarily. I'm asking you as a voter, uh, do you want me to work on these projects? And uh, the voters can say yes or no. And then it's you know it's their community at the end of the day, and, and they have the right to say yes or no on things. So um, some might argue that the elected official was put in charge to make those decisions. Um, and you, that's a valid point. But at the end of the day, I would much rather have the, the support of the community behind a project than try and force something through. So benefit districts are typically created around the perimeter of a municipality or multiple municipalities. And uh, then they would have an interlocal agreement or governing board to, from the electeds within that area to take care of it. Um, and it basically taxes folks uh, on the property taxes or or there's a car tab component, which as you know right now is with uh, the passage of 976, an issue that um, I would suggest a local municipality would want to avoid. But um, so these are sort of the tools that a municipality can use. Um, I think they should be used judiciously. We do need tax dollars to pay for services um, and the cities and our government um, and our local electeds are uh, focused and they should be focused on providing those essential services and the ones that their citizens vote for. Um, and with that, I will close up my comments and I'm sorry the deck was jumping back and forth. Uh, next time I'll check for a transition time. I'm sure it was entertaining and kept you all awake. It was all good, Mark. <laughs> it's all good. Um, we got a number of questions already that are uh, ready to go from the question section on your toolbox, the GoToWebinar toolbox uh, that you can see on your screen. If a question pops up, we have uh, plenty of time to answer uh, all of your questions. You can also email me if that's easier for you. Uh, Dbose, B as in boy, O, Z as in zebra, E as in egg, uh, D, D um, Bose at WashingtonPolicy.org. I'd also like to remind everybody that uh, coming up on May 6th, we'll have uh, another special uh, virtual uh, solution series presentation from Emergent Order. That is uh, going to be on our Free Markets Create campaign, uh, our campaign to uh, uh, kind of um, shift the the, uh, the younger generations and uh, their acceptance of socialism and move them uh, toward a more friendly view of uh, free markets and a more negative view of socialism. So you can see uh, what our campaign's all about and how that's uh, how that's go going to take place uh, coming up on May 6th at 10 a.m. So watch for that and you'll have an opportunity to register for that as well. And we'd urge you to share it with friends um, or anyone else you know who might be interested in, in tackling that issue. Um, obviously it's a very important issue and uh, maybe um, perhaps made more so by the uh, financial challenges that we're uh, facing due to the COVID-19 shutdown. Okay, so what's gonna happen now is I'm gonna shut off my camera so you can focus on uh, our two presenters, Mark Harmsworth, our small business uh, uh, center director, as well as Jason Mercier, our Center for Government Reform director, and we'll start the question period now. Again, you can ask any question you want, just uh, the easiest way is just to use the question function on your toolbox there, the GoToWebinar toolbox. Um, and also uh, for later, there's a handout section there with links to some of uh, Jason's publications, as well as the Washington Policy Center Policy Guide, uh, which is well worth um, load it, downloading on your computer so you can uh, tackle it chapter by chapter uh, to learn more about state policy. Okay, uh, first question, and I think uh, maybe both of you will end up answering it. Uh, the 1% property tax uh, increase cap is fine when property values are increasing greater than expenses. 
what solutions are available for counties where property tax values are flat while expenses are going up, meaning that there's no new or very limited development adding to the tax base? Um, so I talked about the uh, the bank capacity. Um, so if you've been uh, judicious as a municipality, uh, you may have that. In the case of uh, my city, Mill Creek, we did have, um, at the time I was on the council, some of that bank capacity. Um, the the one percent cap can be, and it's a controversial thing in many cases. It can be difficult for a municipality to fit within that budget, but that is the law that um, the state has right now. Um, so we should be anticipating as a municipality not to outgrow that one percent if that's what you feel that you you need. Back to the other taxation items, and and if you're looking at um, a major maintenance and operations piece. Uh, stormwater is one that often hits a city where um, it has to go through and repair a lot of its stormwater drains. That's when you would consider um, a, a going back to the people and saying, hey, we've got this big problem and we need to pay for it. And what do you guys think? Um, and, you know, that would I would suggest that would fall into the um, uh, essential services because you can't do without stormwater drains, obviously. So you're going to have to be careful how you budget there. But planning ahead, and it's difficult because these these city councils are four-year terms in many cases, and you have to think ahead. And often politicians think in four-year chunks, and they're thinking about um, what what their next election is going to be. Let's be frank about it. Um, so uh, we have to be careful and plan ahead. So the other thing I would do, and the state did this a few years ago, it went to a four-year budget cycle. I'd encourage municipalities to come up with a capital improvement plan and think at least 10 or 15 years ahead. I know that cannot take into account things as we're going through right now, and I would argue that this is an extraordinary situation, but it allows you to flatten that curve out just that little bit and then understand where your uh, where your um, uh, finances are going. If you're spending right up to that 1% every single year, it's like maxing out your credit card, you are going to get in trouble eventually. Kind of refreshing, I guess, uh, or I should uh, first check, Jason, did you have anything to add to that? Or? Well, I think the only thing to add to that is along with that bank capacity, you do have the option for a voter lift, and that is where you saw an uh, analogy, I'll go back to the collective bargaining transparency, um, Lincoln County wanted to put a public safety tax on the ballot, but they knew it was going to be difficult to get the voters to approve that unless they could show that everything was scrubbed in their budget and they were making good trade-offs. And that's part of the rationale on why we went to the contract transparency so they could be very open in all their fiscal dealings with their citizens so that they do have to go for a voter lift, they can make that case. Thanks, Jason. Um, it's interesting. The next question deals with the 1984 law, and uh, it seems fitting to have 1984 factor in when a court decides that income is not money. Um, this question is, on what legal basis were the courts able to overturn the 1984 prohibition on city income taxes? Is there any possibility, or is there still any possibility, of restoring or reintroducing that legislation? Hey, at any time, the legislature can say, you know, we really meant what we meant 36 years ago when we passed that. The voters could do the same thing through a ballot measure. I, I think that the, the, the decision that was made by the plaintiffs not to, I mean, that really was just bizarre. Not only the fact that they're saying that a one page bill violated single subject, and if that's the case, then we could be seeing a whole lot of lawsuits being filed against the legislature for violation of single subject. But notwithstanding that, the part of the ruling overlooking the intangible exemption on money to say that income isn't money, it, it's just so bizarre that had that been actually considered by the state Supreme Court, I'm thinking it was a pretty good chance that that part of the appeals court ruling would have been struck down and overturned. The calculation the plaintiffs made is, you know, we won on the graduated, we're going to keep having income defined as property, we'll not have to worry about this, and each local government can decide if they want to face the wrath of their voters trying to impose an income tax on everybody in the city. But at the same time, you, you would like to see, along with the local governments explicitly prohibiting the legislature going back to saying, no, thank you, court. We meant what we meant with our one page bill and we're going to reinstate that ban. Next question. Um, is there a court case or could there be legislation for a right to submit a safe but open plan before you can be summarily shut down? Partitioning is enormously better than six feet of social distance and could be used 
to make uh, any business safe to open, especially restaurants. Um, will anyone be discussing that issue? Well, there is, uh, there's a 13 step um, process that the governor's office is following right now. We're on step 12 and we've stopped at step 12. Step 13, uh, similar to what happened on the East Coast, um, is a basically a quarantine uh, type of situation where the National Guard delivers food to your home, which I really hope we never have to go to. Um, so the, 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 gover the governor has uh, options under his emergency powers to um, quarantine areas. I, I personally would not be in favor of that right now. Um, I think that we should be looking at um, each area, each region of our state individually, and rather than using a sort of a, a very broad stroke approach to how we come out of this COVID situation, we um, look at much more of a regional approach. Kittitas County, as an example, uh, as of Sunday, had had six uh, COVID cases identified and no deaths. So it's very different to King County, Snohomish County, and Pierce County, and the other counties in Puget Sound, where we're seeing uh, much larger numbers, you know, in decline, but much larger numbers. And so I, I think a regional approach would be a good way to get things rolling here. Um, but this, the governor does have the ability to do that if he wanted to. I don't think it's going to be necessary um, uh, quite like they did in the East Coast. Uh, I think we should be uh, looking at some of these other areas where um, it could be safe to do that once we've, you know, we've heard from our medical experts. Dave, if I can, I'd like to address that in a two-part answer. Um, first, going off of what Mark said, at this point, as that curve is being bent down, I think the conversation needs to change from essential, non-essential. I mean, everything's an essential job to every family. But moving away from that standard to the safe, unsafe standard, if construction, grocery stores can follow safety procedures, what's the argument why other employers that meet that criteria can't move forward? And in fact, you're seeing this being executed in a state that's very comparable, not only on a political standpoint, but somewhat on the size. Colorado's governor last Sunday moved from a stay home order to a safer at home order. So still social distancing, still encouraging you to stay home, but phase opening the economy based upon that safe, unsafe standard. And that's something you'd like to see us exercising more in Washington. The second part of that question, it started on litigation. There are currently five cases making its way through the federal courts right now. Uh, one yesterday in Wisconsin on kind of the Wisconsin's governor deciding what business can and can't open arbitrarily. Uh, that is currently before the US Supreme Court and we'll have to take that case up. The case law is very strong on emergency powers of governors. Going back to 1905, the state Supreme Court basically said if there's a, a rational reason for what the governor is calling for, the governor can do that. So we're in a little bit of a, a new phase here though, where you're deciding between which employers can and can't open. And that's where some of that litigation right now is making its way through the courts. But regardless of what the federal courts do, when you look at what Governor Inslee has done in the state of Washington, you can make a political argument, but not really a legal argument. He's been acting within the authority the legislature has granted him. The question is, though, should there be that much unlimited indefinite power, or should the legislature, after 30 days, 45 days, 60 days, be brought back into this discussion? And that, that's something I think going forward we want to take a look at. And I'd like to just jump in, Dave, real quick here. Um, uh, to build on what Jason's saying there, the governor uh, does have authority to continue the emergency declaration. However, um, there are things in statute that he does not have authority to extend unless he gets either the four corners to sign for. That's the Republican and Democrat leadership from both House and Senate. Um, or if we were in session, which we're not right now, the full vote of the legislature. So um, the way you should think about it is he can extend the emergency declaration, he has the power to do that and some of the things that go with that. But where he is suspending RCWs, he cannot do that uh, without the authority of the legislature or the four corners. And so uh, right now we're hearing that uh, the fourth may be it for some of them because uh, he does need four signatures. Um, so we'll see what that looks like here. I believe there's going to be an announcement on Friday from his office is what I've been hearing. Um, and I'm sure that that has to be done uh, with haste uh, for Monday. If the, the emergent de declaration can be extended, but a lot of the suspension, so the deferral B&O tax, for example, the deferral of some of the property taxes 
would um, not be able to be extended past that point without the four corners, the four signatures being able to extend it. So there's a there's a slight nuance in what he can and what he cannot do. And he does have a press conference at 2.30 today, subject matter, Just tune in and find out. It's likely that that press conference will be streamed live uh, at the Washington Policy Center Facebook page. So you can watch for that. Quick reminder, we have three handouts for you in the handout section here on your go to webinar uh, tool uh, box there on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, just um, uh, bring that uh, menu down and you can uh, go to any of the of Jason's publications or the Washington Policy Center Policy Guide. I'd also point out if you check out our homepage, WashingtonPolicy.org, uh, Jason has a blog post about uh, executive powers um, that he just referenced, and you could uh, read that or share that as, as you would. Uh, next question, uh, define the term banked capacity. Uh, so bank capacity is the um, part of the law that was passed on the 1% uh, property tax increase several years ago. What that means is in year one, your municipality can increase property taxes by 1% with a vote of the council member, majority vote of the council members. If it chooses not to, it can put that into the bank, if you like. And then the following year, it can raise property taxes 1% again, but it can also go back to that bank and use that 1%, so it would do a total of 2%. So if you were to not raise property taxes as a municipality for five years, you would have 5% in bank capacity that you could then use in year six, seven or eight, depending on how you want to do it. And so um, you may feel we're good on budget. We don't need to ask our citizens for anything else. Maybe times are hard like they are now. So we're going to put a, we're not going to do it. We're just going to buckle down and make sure that we're only doing the things we're supposed to do. And then in a few years, you say, look, we've streamlined everything. We've laid off everybody except one police officer, uh, which feels like that in Seattle sometimes. Um, and then uh, you need to increase the taxes to cover some of the extra stuff there. Then you may choose to use 2 or 3% of that bank capacity. Okay, next question. Mr. Mercier, cities are currently able to impose a flat income tax. Do counties also have that capability? So when you look at the appeals court decision, it made it based upon being a first class or a code city. So they didn't directly address counties, but the rationale from their argument is that if the legislature is given property tax authority, it's given income tax authority. So it, the ruling doesn't say counties, but I believe you could uh, infer from that that anybody with property tax authority has the authority for the income tax. Next question came in via email. Does the governor realize um, that this shutdown has cost Washington revenue a great deal? And has he elaborated on, on any plans to make up for that revenue? Um, I, I don't want to speak for what the governor realizes and doesn't realize. I can only um, make observations on what I'm seeing. Um, I, I think from a state's perspective right now, uh, they're living on borrowed time. The the sales tax revenue, the the property tax revenue, and the other taxes that state collects from uh, private industry, which is the industry that's funding we as citizens fund our state government, um, is is drying up. And so you're going to see here in the next month, two, three months, that revenue that the state was expecting that it had budgeted for disappear, and it has some reserve capacity but there will be some hard decisions that need to be made here in the next uh, month or two by the state, which um, I know uh, JT Wilcox, the Republican leader has indicated will require a, a special session of the legislature to go through and figure out how to deal with that. They're gonna be looking at a significant uh, downfall in uh, property and in, in tax revenue, whether that's, you've seen projections of 5 billion, up to 5 billion, even 10 billion. The state budget this year was about 50 billion, and, and Jason will correct me on the final number, I'm sure. Um, but that's a large portion. Uh, now, the, uh, the, the House this year did pass a significant increase, as it did last session as well, in spending in the state budget. And that's going to be one of the first places they look to do rollbacks. You're going to see some significant cuts um, to the state budget, and uh, we are sort of waiting with bated breath, unfortunately, to see where they're going to be. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see reduction in force. You're going to see reduction in, in service capabilities. 
um, because this is going to be a very significant uh, hit on our state uh, tax revenues. The worst thing the state could do at this point, though, is turn around and say, we can't afford this. We need to do a tax increase because or we need a new tax like an income tax because that just places the burden even significantly more on folks that are just trying to make it each day who may be back to work at that point and really are not going to be able to afford um, to pay the bill for the state. Now, I'll point to a few things that have happened since this news broke. The governor, before he signed the supplemental budget, did issue, I believe, a record 147 sectional vetoes, which brought down that four-year spending by about $400 million. So the supplemental budget was still too big, but they took immediate steps to at least re reduce the, the, the bleeding from increasing spending even further. We have seen the Office of Financial Management, which is the governor's budget office, send out budget instructions to all of the agencies basically to anticipate cuts and start identifying where those reductions can happen as far as well as opportunities for additional budget savings. Tomorrow is the state's economic forecast. Now that's not the revenue forecast. That's not going to happen until June. But there are some rumors that with that economic forecast tomorrow at 10 o'clock, they may try to do an initial preview of what some of the revenue numbers look like because up to this point, we still have not had a full month of tax collections to show what has happened from those shutdowns. And that's what the state, city, and counties will then use to forecast out their losses. The other aspect of this is there are federal funds that have been appropriated from the original CARES Act. The state of Washington, state and local share of that was just under $3 billion, but it was severely restricted. So do the feds provide more flexibility with those? Because Washington had a not a huge reserve, but a decent reserve, about under $3 billion. So if they're able to access any of those original care funds, that will help go a long way to whether it's a four, five, six, seven billion dollar deficit like some are forecasting. You you don't want the government or the legislature to come into a special session until they know what they're dealing with. And we're really not going to know what they're dealing with till June, because if you bring them in today, they may make decisions that make the situation worse. So it will happen at some point. It is on the governor's radar. It is going to be some high popping numbers as far as what we're facing. Um, so the advice at this point is just don't make things worse. But at this point, a brief follow up, uh, Jason, if, if I could. Um, at this point, though, uh, even in situations like in public education where uh, the schools have been closed, is, is, is it accurate to say that uh, the employees are still getting uh, paid fully, and and I'm not sure if that's the same in the Fish and Wildlife Department and in other departments where there's uh, maybe a, uh, there has been some uh, closures in terms of public access and presumably a reduction in in workload. Um, sure. So have, have there been any direct actions to, you know, um, mitigate the circumstances right now? Like at least you know if you if you had something in your budget, you wouldn't go through with it right now because you're not sure what's going to happen in June, so to speak? Primarily at the local level, you have seen, whether it's a, a freeze in hiring or freeze in uh, compensation increase, um, but kind of like with the state, until they know what their budget number is, they don't know what they're trying to fix. So at this point, they're trying not to make the situation worse by not adding new spending to it. You've seen this also with some of the colleges stopping hiring at this point. Um, the interesting thing on the schools, though, and I know this wasn't directly the question, more likely than not, we're going to have a fall COVID wave, and it could come back again next spring. So if we are hearing that schools can't provide the remote learning right now, are we really going to be saying to students, you're going to be going a year without dependable educational resources? We've we got to figure out how to address this now so that we don't lose an entire another year of education. What kind of, oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah, I just want to add on just a little bit. I think where we're going to see actually some of the biggest issues is with the local cities um, who do not have the tolerance that the state does, even in its limited capacity to get through this. I mean, your local city that is uh, heavily dependent on sales tax, as an example, Linwood in uh, Snohomish County, um, they have Alderwood Mall, which generates a lot of sales tax for them, and it's a significant portion of their budget. Um, I haven't looked at their budgets yet, but I would suspect that they're going to see some significant shortfalls. And so with 
a city like Linwood that has a large um, police force, which is an essential service and needs to be fully manned, um, it's going to be very. There's going to be some very difficult choices they're going to have to make um, as we get into this, and they do not have the same ability as the state to move things around to, to the same degree. It's uh, most of the municipality costs are, um, you know, operations costs for infrastructure and payroll. So it's going to be there's going to be some tough days ahead for our local municipalities, um, even more so than the state. What kind of economic costs do you foresee on the state of Washington if proponents of city income taxes are successful? What might governments do with the influx of money? And on the flip side, how is it likely to affect individuals, families, and businesses? Well, and this is where you get into, there are, are policy reasons why you wouldn't want to go down the road of a statewide income tax, right? It's a more volatile revenue source, which causes some additional budget pressures when you are in a downturn. That's why you're seeing situations in California and New York right now. There is the the psychological aspect of we do know, and in fact, we just had our solution summit where we highlighted an employer who came from California to Washington and brought his businesses and his employees with them because we didn't have an income tax. And you'll not be surprised the other states he was looking at was Texas and Florida. Now, those are two more non-income tax states. We know that Washington just lost out to Florida, a major aerospace company that is in Nevada right now, again, another no income tax state. And part of the reason why it went to Florida versus Washington was some of this uncertainty about what is the state gonna do with tax policy. So if you start to see Seattle and others basically become income tax islands, it's very easy for those individuals and those employers to go elsewhere in the state. And that's partly why this was never about Seattle imposing an income tax, it wanted one across the state, because nobody wants to be on that island. Like an economic, uh, a refuge of being able to move around just by going to Bellevue or to Federal Way or someplace else. Especially in this economic climate, you could try to impose an income tax and you could try to pencil that money into your outlook. But it, I know that this may seem counterintuitive, but income taxes tend to fall faster than sales taxes in the recession because even when you're unemployed, you're still getting unemployment dollars, federal assistance, and you're then purchasing things with that. There's still some sales tax activity occurring. If you're unemployed, there's nothing to tax on your income. So you're really not able to tax your way out of recession. About the nitpicky way the 1984 bill was overturned, criminal law allows for harmless error, um, not overturning a verdict. Why isn't there such a thing as a harmless error concept available to avoid overturns of statutes? The overturn seems very nitpicky. When the appeals court issued its decision, it, it nobody had asked them to make that ruling. They invented a new standard that had not been briefed by any of the parties, and that's what made it so shocking. It's almost like they tried to create a way to make sure the Supreme Court would take this case, because if they had just ratified the King County Superior Court, there was no way the Supreme Court was ever going to take this. So the Supreme Court still didn't take it, but at least the appeals court served them up a, co a controversy to look at. After that ruling came out, because it was so bizarre, they were asked to reconsider. And they took extensive briefing on whether or not to reconsider that ruling, but ultimately decided not to. So I don't know if you, you can't really pass a law to try to keep a court from making a bad decision. It's going to happen. It's just that the precedent that had been set by that, though, I mean, if you really wanted to have some fun with it, it's kind of open season now to go through every bill the legislature has passed and say, now, which one can we make an argument on that wasn't a single subject? Is it fair for government to ask citizens uh, for emergency uh, medical levies or emergency medical services? Isn't that a primary government function? Um, yeah, it's uh, and think of it more as um, it's a dedicated tax um, for the EMS levies. Um, it, it also, I think, increases transparency that you know that that EMS levy is going to pay for your emergency medical services. Um, and, you know, arguably, uh, and I think I mentioned this in the, in the presentation, that your EMS levy doesn't cover your full EMS contract in many cases because it can be more expensive uh, for a small municipality, uh, 20000 or less, to provide those services itself. Typically, um, a city will use an EMS levy even if it runs its own fire department um, or medic uh, group, and they'll outsource the medic to Medic One and, and so forth if they can. 
Um, there are also contract services as well. So uh, the the reason I think EMS is okay is because it provides that transparency and it also uh, enables you as a taxpayer to be a little more um, finite in the way that you you may, for example, oppose uh, just picking something random, library expansion. Um, and I don't know why you'd hate the kids, of course, but you may expose library expansion. So you're able then to vote for EMS, which you consider to be a, an essential service and the costs that go with that. And you may vote against uh, the library service, EMS levy increased or from the library district or whatever it is. So there's some dials and needles that you can, as a voter, then choose. Um, that's why I think personally that, that the EMS levy is a useful tool because you know where that money's going. Well, that just about uh, closes our time. I would like to uh, thank, uh, thank Mark Harmsworth, our Small Business Center Director, for joining us, and Jason Mercier, our Center for Government Reform Director. I'd like to remind everybody of their uh, work. You can catch up with it on the blog, and there's publications almost daily from all of our re research team at WashingtonPolicy.org. Our next uh, virtual solution series presentation is May 6th. That's with Emergent Order. That's a marketing firm, an award-winning, innovative, and really bold marketing firm that we've teamed up with in order to launch our Free Markets Create program. This is um, our program to try to shift uh, the views of particularly younger 18 to 34 year old, uh, the younger generations, when it comes to uh, their um, increasing acceptance of socialism. We're trying to flip that around so that they uh, view of free markets more favorably and socialism less favorably and there's some tested messaging that we've been uh, we've been conducting um, to successfully do that so we want to present that uh, that program to you that's May 6th at 10 a.m. so be sure to register for that thank you so much for joining us today and if you have any further questions we're always available via email and we hope uh, we'll see you on May 6th